As we come to the 30th lecture in our handout church history, let us have a word of prayer. O oh God, thou who hast sent thy Son to redeem a people, to be his bride forevermore from out of a lost mankind, and that grand divine endeavor constitutes the history of the church, the history of Christ seeking for his own. And we come to this particularly rich strain in the story of the church, the history of Puritanism. We pray that we may understand what drove it so hard and made it so powerful in its influence past and present. For Christ's sake we pray, amen. Lecture 30, Puritanism in England and in New England. One, there converged in the Presbyterianism of Scotland and England and an independent and Baptistic strand, the purest form of Reformation theology, Puritanism. <coughs> you may be a little surprised to hear me say the purest form of theology, because I have said more than once in this little series that the Reformation itself, in my opinion, was the greatest historical episode in the church's history since Pentecost itself. The reason I give this particular accolade to the movement we're about to study here is not inconsistent with that high estimate of the Reformation itself. I believe Puritanism to be squarely founded on the great principles of the Reformation and with a bandage of a century or so subsequent to that era, the insights and applications of that theology that the Reformers themselves never had opportunity to develop. So in a certain sense, in my view of things, Puritanism is the Reformation coming into its own in perhaps the purest expression of that remarkably pure episode that church history subsequently afforded. <coughs> Number two, most of the continent, as we noticed, had come to terms with medieval sacramentalism, or its rough reformed equivalent of tying the offspring of believers with sacramental grace, though not ex opera operata. Let me remind you, perhaps it's necessary if we're going to understand what Puritanism did not uh, do in particular. I remind you that Augustine the great theologian of the early church and his influence was highly regarded through, uh, throughout the medieval church, but that great as was the esteem in which he was held, the church shrank back from the full Augustine, particularly at this point of resisting grace. They recognized grace had to change a person, but they hung in to the end for the idea that it was not irresistible. They held in so long that I don't think they quite convinced themselves, as they should have, that they were breaking with the great Augustine at that point. Now, as the centuries moved on, this particular error of denying irresistible grace and giving man more of a role in the initiation of his redemption than he actually performs. This weakness became even weaker, but was systematized, especially at the Fourth Lateran in 1215, where we, before that also, where the idea of regeneration is actually conceived of as ex opera operata, that is, when baptism is administered, ex opera, that which it represents is produced or is affected. 
Now you can see that is a much deeper step away from the evangelical and reformed principle because even though this says that God is going to do the work, man has the control of its administration and the person to whom it is administered can reject that grace and actually on his deathbed perish. So that in a certain sense, the 13th century represents an incarnation of this principle. Well, when we came to the 16th century Reformation, this went out. Even with Martin Luther, the leader of the conservative Reformation, who did believe that the baptized infant was converted, even he had an uneasy conscience about this doctrine here, and I'd almost say invented, though of course he didn't think that, but nevertheless introduced the idea of infantile faith, an idea I'm afraid more preposterous than ex opera operata because an infant simply can't understand what we call faith. Nevertheless, we do have biblical evidence that an infant even in the womb can be converted, at least that's the usual interpretation of John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb, leaping at the approach of Mary carrying Jesus in her body. But at any rate, what we're at right now by way of review is the fact that even in the midst of this great work of God, the Protestant Reformation, the drag back toward the Middle Ages was there and it was noticeable even in Martin Luther, this idea of children being converted by the faith of the church, actually. I never mentioned this before, but maybe it would be in order to mention now that Luther referred to the parable, I mean to the story of the cripple who was carried by four persons, you know, to Jesus and was healed by Jesus. Martin Luther saw those who bore his carriage, pallet, as actually the counterpart of believing Christians who bring their children. And in a certain sense, just as the carriers of this lame man were the instrument of his being healed, Luther saw the church as the instrument of the child's being made alive. Now, we see, therefore, this medieval drag pulling even the Reformation back somewhat, and not only in Luther, but though to a lesser degree, even in Calvin, and you remember the way it appeared in Calvin, when he comments on those biblical texts of, of such is the kingdom of God, which our Lord said as he took the children in his hands, in that great section in the sacraments on the, in, uh, in the institutes, Calvin is saying in no uncertain terms that the children of believing parents are themselves children of God. You notice that he opposes their being admitted to the Lord's Supper only because they can't discern the Lord's body. He doesn't say what we say he should have said, there's no evidence that these children are born again. Now, even if they were able to discern the meaning of the Lord's Supper, they couldn't be administered. On the contrary, the impression you get is that he's opposed to pedo or pido communion only because the children can't discern the meaning of it, not because they're not qualified to receive the sacrament. Now, when we come to the Puritan movement, we see a wholesome corrective of this tendency. And in the Puritan movement in England and in New England, it was very clear that any vestigial remains of human ability to resist the work of God when he actually recreates the soul is out of uh, consideration. And any notion that a child born of Christian parents or otherwise is a child of the kingdom uh, that's a meaningful translation of Christ's words of such as the kingdom that they really are members of the body of Jesus Christ born of the Spirit. The Puritans cannot tolerate, but take that as a symbol uh, 
of what Jesus says in another place, that unless you become as a little child, you adults, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And the Puritans would see Christ saying to, about these children of such a king, of such as the kingdom of God, and of such a disposition, of such a character, of such a childlike trust, and so on. But any idea of their being regenerate or being in the covenant of grace salvifically, the Puritans not only don't entertain, but they eradicate and thus restore Reformed theology to a purer form than even the Reformation fully achieved. Number three, since all Calvinists favored the biblical teaching that all men are born dead in sin and are not necessarily regenerated when baptized, their only possible conclusion was this. Though children of believers are in the covenant of grace in some sense, that sense does not necessarily include election. Let me read that again, please. Since all Calvinists favored the biblical teaching that all men are born dead in sin and are not necessarily regenerated when baptized, their only possible conclusion was this. Though children of believers are in the covenant of grace, it's in some sense that sense does not necessarily include election. In seminary, I used to contrast the Puritan view with what came to be the standard Scottish-American Presbyterian view. Jonathan Edwards, as typical of the English, New English Puritans, and Charles Hodge of the typical Presbyterian, Scottish, Calvinistic tradition. I'd say to the students, the Puritans would operate on the principle that the baptized child, I better say baptized to, make, to remind you that this is in the pedo-baptistic tradition. All Baptists would agree with this, of course, but this is within the pedo-baptistic tradition. And we're saying to our Baptist friends, even though in their opinion, we make the mistake of baptizing children. We don't all make the mistake of supposing that those children are therefore elect or due to be regenerated or already regenerated. But baptized children are not thereby, or therein even, regenerated. And we must assume they are little sinners, little unregenerate sinners, until evidence to the contrary. Edwards himself would work very, very carefully with the 11 children he had for their salvation. He'd make it very clear to them that they were, there's no evidence that they were regenerate or elect. They were born dead in trespasses and sins, and they had to be born again. And what he had preached to the congregation in Northampton, warning the little children, if you die unconverted, you will go to hell. He was telling his own children as well, operating in all of the Puritans on this same fundamental principle that even baptized children of the covenant, who are in the covenant in so, some sense or other, are not thereby regenerate or elect, and we must assume, this is the main point right now, we must assume they are little sinners until evidence to the contrary. Well, Hodge was saying on the, that we, yeah, I'm not quoting anybody here, understand, this is just my uh, statement of the way they thought. Uh, but he would be, I, I don't know if they ever used this language, for example, that's much more 20th century language, but the idea was plain, and though as far as I remember, Hodge never used this language, the thought was, we must assume, perhaps that's a little strong, should assume about children such as this, they are converted. They are converted, 
until evidence to contrary. I think you realize that makes a great deal of difference in the way a family and a church goes about the rearing of their uh, children. Edwards and Hodge were both concerned to see their children live forevermore. Edwards and Hodge both agreed that they were not regenerated by the sacrament. Strangely, you may, if you don't know Hodge, you'd be surprised, I guess, to hear me say just from this that Hodge believed in predestination and Hodge believed that children in Christian families were lost. But at the same time that they shared that type of doctrine, mainly because of a somewhat different view, the Reformed Presbyterian theologians had from the Puritan Calvinistic theologians, had them seeing the children normally in the family of God. And while not regenerated by the infant baptism, nevertheless, they almost felt it was a natural thing. Hodge would die rather than say it was actually natural, but I mean, it was almost a normal thing for God to call these children to himself, and consequently, they fell into this way of thinking that it is a little Christian until there's evidence to the fact by its profanity, by its explicit rejection of, uh, of Christ, by its uh, hatred of morality, by its detestation of the church and such things as that, the little child is not a converted person. On the other hand, here you'd look for the first sign of conviction. Those of you who know anything of the history of Edwards know that when that first Awakening broke out in 33 and 34, 1733 and 34 in Northampton. Edwards, a great student of Christian experience, examined little Phoebe Bartlett, age four, very, very carefully. And when the finest student of the Christian life rendered the verdict that as far as he could judge, Phoebe Bartlett was a Christian, you could be sure that she had very compelling evidence. And she lived 80 years as if to persuade the world that Edward's judgment was not precipitate. But anyway, you see, I say as a Calvinist to my fellow Calvinists and so on, how can you come at any other conclusion on the basis of your biblical Calvinism that of course a child born dead has to be assumed to be dead? Since there's no promise that every child of a believer will be converted and is elect, why wouldn't you assume? that it's unconverted and it may re remain unconverted. Why wouldn't your prayer be to vi that God would bring this child of yours savingly to him and so on? Why wouldn't you look for evidence to the contrary of his deadness in signs of spiritual life? And say, where in the world would a reformed theologian get this? But we've already seen. Calvin's further down that path than Charles Hodge. Where's it come from? Well, you've already seen where it comes from. They see certain passages which teach that. <laughs> this sounds rather strange for a mini Calvinist to be saying about some extraordinarily maxi Calvinists that they just weren't thinking very clearly. They were so moved by Christ taking the little children in arms and saying certain words. I've heard John Murray say the same thing, for example, that they for almost forgot their Calvinism. They almost forgot these were little sinners they had in their hand and that what they were models of was not conversion, but the attitude native to a child, which would be in an adult person deliberately taken evidence of the person's salvation. Be that as it may, it looks as if two homers nodded here. John Calvin and Charles Hodge and a good many other homers which also nodded in my opinion. Number four, consequently, all baptized children were still according to a sound view, sinners, or as Edwards once called them, little vipers. I mentioned that in a book I wrote back in 1960, and I haven't heard the end of the rumbles that that particular statement of Ed Edwards made. When in a lecture I once, this is a Covenant uh, College, in a lecture I once referred to Edwards as little vipers, one reform minister present for that lecture sent me a note. It read, little vipers 
in covenantal diapers. Little vipers in covenantal diapers. The note contained no explanation, but I think the man meant that the covenant relationship somehow removed the child's viperish condition or responsibility, therefore. That could only be if the covenant somehow promised that the child was elect, if not regenerate. Now, whether that was in that theologian's mind, I don't know. But it's the only thing that comes into my mind which could justify what I take it was the interpretation of the little note. A little viper and covenantal diapers. You're not denying Edwards is right. He born little vipers. But he seemed to be inferring that the covenant put on these protective diapers and somehow or other made the child effective in the kingdom, a true child of God. I don't know what else to make of that thing. I've seen him since, but I've never had any chance to talk to this gentleman, so I'm not even using his name here. But it's, when I get an opportunity, I'd like to hear him spell out. He's a very competent Reformed theologian. I'd like to have him spell out his meaning. In the meantime, I have to labor under the, especially with the knowledge of what has happened in historic Calvinism and that this type of thinking, though it's, I've never encountered it in that particularly graphic form, is fairly widespread in Reformed uh, circles. Number seven, but the Puritans could find no biblical evidence for such a comforting doctrine. That is at all, I'm thinking now of the fact that while that was a rather unique statement, that this little viper was in covenantal diapers, it's almost uh, axiomatic in our century to use the expression, such as you have in a number of creeds, that all children dying in infancy are elect. All children dying in infancy are elect. I know one pastor very well who whenever he baptizes a child, he says, this child is in Christ Jesus. I think sometimes he spells it out. I know this is in his mind. I think people have asked him that if it dies during that period, it will most certainly go to heaven. Sometimes I think I've heard him say that from the pulpit. I know that's his thinking, and I'm, I'm sure that's what his people understand. But he could, at whatever age, 8, 9, 10, 12, or whatever, he could reject that gospel. Now, you see, obviously, that pastor is thinking that every child of a Christian parent presented for baptism is actually in a saving covenant of grace if he dies before an age of accountability. If he dies after that, then of course he could reject that status. But <laughs> I don't have enough time to go into the fine points here. I think you can, uh, you're gonna have to work it out. I only got a couple more minutes left. You're gonna have to work it out for yourself. But this is the nice question. Could this man who's a reformed theologian, and could the others who say this type of thing, all children dying in infancy are elect. It's very seldom in the creeds, but if they grow up, they may reject Christ. Shoot. Could a reformed person ever say that a baptized child is elected as infancy and not elected as mature? Of course not. Can't imagine Charles Hodge saying such a thing as that or any other reformed theologian saying that. What do they have in mind, therefore? Well, as I say, I could tell you a little bit about it. I don't think it justifies as a statement, but I don't even have the time to go any further into it. Right now, I'm just showing that the Puritan tradition corrected a tendency that was even in John Calvin and became enshrined in later Scottish American Calvinism and even more so in Dutch American Calvinism, but was never a part of Scottish, English, New English uh, uh, Puritanism to the glory, I think, of uh, Puritanism. Number seven, but the Puritans could find no biblical evidence for a comfort, that such a comforting doctrine. The Puritans, someone has said, never diluted the vinegar of life. This is a good message, you know. What minister doesn't like to be able to stand in the pulpit and say that every child who ever die is elect and in heaven? I wish I could say it. 
I don't know anybody who isn't happy to say it with a clear conscience and so on, but the Puritans couldn't see that taught in the Bible, and neither can I. And I'm constantly astounded by the fact that it has become a kind of tradition even in Calvin, and it's reasserting itself with great vigor in our time. Eight, God did say when he established the Abrahamic covenant, I will be God to you and to your descendants after you, Genesis 17, 7, 9. But God did not say all the descendants of Abraham and the rest of the Bible points to the spiritual seed of Abraham, especially in Romans. This is where the idea gets started in a sense. I'll be your God and the God of your seed after you is the King James way of staying it. The God of your descendants after you. One has to admit something we've seen more than once in the history of the church. The Bible at first glance can be easily misinterpreted, but we're not allowed just to take a first glance at the Bible. We have to ponder its meaning. And if at first when you read God saying to Abraham, I'll be your God and the God of your seed or your descendants after you, I, I would admit the theology of the first glance is that those children are to be in the same relation as Abraham was. But when you read about Ishmael himself not being elect and that Isaac's twin sons had an Esau whom God had hated as well as a Jacob whom he loved, you realize right in the context, whatever that passage means, it doesn't mean that all the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, or any other chosen person is elect. Number 10, and finally, furthermore, uh, I'm just writing now what I've just blurted out there, Ishmael was the natural seed of Abraham and Esau, the natural seed of Isaac. Let me just conclude this lecture explaining why I have such a high estimate of Puritanism. They preserved the integrity of the Reformation and they avoided the built-in tendency toward a return to medieval sacramentalism or something so closely associated with it that offspring of believers were almost inevitably considered elect, whether they died in infancy or didn't. I haven't had time to mention in this lecture, and I don't feel badly about it, because you all know it. If you're familiar with the Puritans at all, they also made a great advance in the Reformation in applying the Christian religion to their, to their own hearts and examining themselves very, very thoroughly, and as much as they possibly could, see to it that every biblical principle was put into practice in society. That's what they are most famous for because people are interested in that who couldn't care less about conversion and the things of the soul which actually motivated the Puritans in this particular endeavor.